followed by the portrait. He held my two hands and he asked me to marry him. And I said, sure. She's a genuinely strong woman and genuinely very, very fragile as well. Quite a combination. Once you're her friend, on whatever level, you can count on it, f you know, for the rest of your life. If I had a role for me, I wouldn't hesitate one second. Her involvement in her life is with her children. Her being an actress is almost superfluous to her. So she always told me, whenever negative things come up in your life, just keep going, because there's always a positive side to everything. The fact that the partner that you've chosen would stray to begin with is, is hard to swallow. But when it's with your own child. Certainly it was most difficult on my mother, but she rallied the whole family together and we're all the better for it. The man will go. The children will always be there for her. This is Blythe Danner. She is a committed, extraordinary woman. My friend, Mia Farrow. I never did get to become a pediatrician and go to work in Vietnam, but I am taking care of children who need a lot of extra help. So I've been, aren't I lucky, you know, to have had a life that's enabled me to fulfill my dream. Mia Farah's mother, Maureen O'Sullivan, was born in Ireland. She was exceptionally beautiful and possessed the wit, charm, and whimsy that is uniquely Irish. She was discovered by Hollywood and landed many roles, including Jane in the Tarzan films. Before long, she was courted by the dashing Australian writer, John Farrow. They lived together for two years before they married, a scandalous thing for a woman to do in those days. And I think a lot of people tried to dissuade her from becoming involved with my father because he had this reputation. But um, they married anyway. And my mother was uh, really something. She was hot stuff. <laughs> they were quite a pair. Soon after they married, Maureen put aside her career for motherhood. Their first child was Michael, followed by Patrick. In 1945, they welcomed a little sister. I was born in Beverly Hills, California, in just about the prettiest house that you could possibly imagine with a beautiful garden and a swimming pool. And we had sidewalks that we could ride our bikes on. And uh, we had nannies, um, sets of nannies. Mia's nannies were, I think they were Irish. And uh, Barbara, I think, was Scotch. So it was a sort of United Nations of, of nannies. That was my nanny that's holding the baby, who is Mia's little sister, Prudence. And uh, I'm sitting on a, a wooden rocking horse that Mrs. Farrow had uh, painted for me and uh, Mia's there on the end. It was the norm for Catholic families in Hollywood to have many children, and the Pharaohs would have a total of seven. As far as Mia was concerned, this was the perfect-sized family. I have these sense memories of my mother. Um, my mother rustling into the nursery where we were sleeping, and um, I and my three sisters um, in bed for the night, scent of jasmine, and intermingled with my mother's perfume. And she would tell us these magical stories of her childhood in Ireland. And I've spent a significant time in Ireland getting to know my aunts. We used to go there when we were children, almost every summer. Mia and her father shared a love of reading. Their special time was walking to a local bookstore where he bought her any book she desired. I would skip trying to match his long stride um, through Beverly Hills a few blocks over to our house with my books under my arm. And I, I adored him. I just, I just adored him. He was so handsome. And, and he loved me so much. 
we had, the, we had a shared birthday one day apart. My father was also a womanizer of, of legendary proportions. I mean, he had affairs with just about every beautiful actress in Hollywood, so they say. And I don't doubt it for a second. My mother actually went to, got, reached a point where she put a, a separate door in so that he could come and go into his bedroom when she wouldn't let him in hers without waking her up because he would come in all hours of the night. Maureen quietly suffered her husband's infidelities because she loved him. While her parents coped with such problems, Mia thrived in her fairy tale existence. She was willful like her father and like her mother loved the theater. The four pharaoh girls and the three roach girls um, sort of banded together and Mia being the oldest and, and definitely the bossiest um, was always in charge. I fought for everything. Uh, I fought for uh, everything that I felt was fair and, and, and right and or mine or um, what I wanted to do I, I, and I'd organize everybody all the time. I was the director, I put on the plays, I wrote them, I cast them, I gave myself the best roles. Mia and Maria loved playing the role of mother to animals of all kinds. We didn't understand the reproductive habits of hamsters. I had about probably 200 hamsters at one time. We always had secret snakes and lizards and hamsters and guinea pigs. And Ducks. We had a dog, always cats, um, snakes, lizards. I loved all of them, turtles. Uh, and we'd have elaborate funerals. But Mia's greatest love was what she felt for her brother, Michael. Michael was the, I mean, quite simply, the, the bright star of the family. He was definitely kind of all of our hero. He was, he graduated at 15 from uh, high school. Um, he went to Georgetown University at 16. He called me Mouse because I was mousy. Um, but I didn't mind coming from him. It was a compliment. It was, uh, I loved him so. He was, he was really special. Everything about Mia's life was truly magical until her ninth birthday. Always a fragile child, she collapsed in inexplicable pain. She could not stand up. Mia had contracted the dread disease of the 50s for which there was no cure and no vaccine. Infantile paralysis, polio. And suddenly I was in an ambulance, ambulance headed downtown where I'd never been except to get my passport picture taken. And, and suddenly I was in the, the wards for contagious diseases and um, taken away from my parents, other kids screaming, uh, getting a second spinal tap, uh, diagnosis confirmed, and um, kids dying, kids struggling to breathe iron lungs lining the hallways, the general pandemonium of that time, and the fear in the eyes of everyone who was treating me. In the hospital, everyone was afraid of me. The nurses were afraid. The doctors were afraid. Mia was lucky. After a few weeks, it was clear she would not die and would not be paralyzed. Her father was able to bring her home, but to a home scorched by fear, fear of her very self. The swimming pool had been drained, the rugs had been torn up, the furniture had been recovered, all my toys had been burned, the dog had been given away, the lawn had been reseeded, torn up and reseeded. I was home from school for, for six months after that, and only Maria uh, had the courage to, to come and see me. The fact that Mia had polio was, you know, didn't stop me for a minute, and all of her brothers and sisters had been sent away. And she was, you know, my best friend. I say it was constructive in the long run because it made me aware that as we speak, as I eat my chocolate cake, my ice cream, or uh, ride my horse, or hug my children, somebody is in terrible pain and afraid. Lots of somebody's. And I, it hadn't crossed my mind and it never left my mind from that time on. And I have no doubt that it shaped my life and the decisions that I would make.
in the future. I wasn't sure what to do about it, but I knew I had a responsibility. Coming up, Mia endures great loss and becomes Mrs. Frank Sinatra. You can't intimate portrait, Mia Farrow. Early on, Mia realized that her life would not be average. In fact, she would lead many lives, and all of them very different. I kept being picked up out of my world and dropped, you know, picked up out of my Beverly Hills garden and dropped in the, in the, in the public ward for contagious diseases. I was picked up there and then dropped back into my life, and then picked up from there and then dropped into another life in Spain. I learned Spanish. I got my ears pierced. I tried to pretend I was Spanish. I had my dreams in Spanish. I was Spanish. And then I was picked out of there, and then I was dropped into Eng in England. Then I had an English accent, and I was English. At 13, Mia was sent to a strict Catholic boarding school. While visiting her parents in London, she experienced her first great loss. The perfect family had lost its hero, her 19-year-old brother, Michael. I could hear my mother crying, but I'd never heard her cry like that. I mean, it was the most awful, awful sound. And um, she told me that my, my brother was dead. And... Um, that it had been an air crash and and I just kept saying are you sure you know how do you know how, how are you how can you be sure it's him and um my father was just sitting on the couch just grief stricken devastated Mia's parents flew to Los Angeles for the funeral I saw Mrs. Farrow who I hadn't seen in a couple of years and she had just become what would seem to be overnight just an old woman but I, I, I don't think I've been that down ever. And that was one that could have, that could have wrecked me. I mean, the nuns were all talking about God's will and things, which only made me very angry. I eventually, in that, that setting, found a core of myself, uh, just a shred of a core. Um, and it, and it was the same self that, that had survived the polio. John Farrow was so distraught by Michael's death, he collapsed into a deep depression and could not work. Maureen knew exactly what to do. She moved to New York and resumed her career on the stage. But what would her eldest daughter do? I, I re realistically could have and intended to go to college, go to medical school, get a degree, become a pediatrician and go and work in either Africa or Southeast Asia. That was the dream. But the dream would have to wait because Maureen needed help earning money to support the whole family. Mia moved to New York and optimistically began a stage career in The Importance of Being Earnest. My mother was in this play, Never Too Late, on Broadway, and we went out and celebrated. We drank champagne, and she'd go to her play and I'd go to my play. It was, it, was so, it was so much fun. At 18, her winsome beauty was a magnet for all sorts of people. One night, en route to a party, she met the eccentric artist Salvador Dali in, of all places, an elevator. And I heard a little sound from behind a little chuckle. He said, uh, I am Dali, I'm completely crazy. And uh, I, I, I was absolutely charmed, you know? How, how great. He just was... Uh, all about miracles. He was about magic and miracles and, uh, and rejoicing and celebrating. He threw money out the window. His wife was fortunately in control of the money because, I mean, he was, he was right. He was crazy. He said, the more you throw out the window, the more will come back to you. I learned a lot of things from him. Yeah. Yeah, he was a wonderful man. One night, Mia's father, who was critically ill in California, kept calling his wife in New York. He seemed desperate to speak with Maureen. Mia could not tell him her mother was out with another man. She simply stopped answering the phone. And the phone rang and rang and rang and rang and rang and rang. I mean, just rang through the night. And I just held the pillow over my ears. And then finally my mother came in and then the phone rang again. And it was the doctor and he he said my father was dead, and that he died with the phone in his hand. It was her second huge loss. 
But Mia did not attend the funeral. You know, money was a factor. Um, and also, what was the point? You know, he was dead. Now it was imperative that Mia earn money. Luckily, she was offered a lucrative starring role as the youngest cast member in a completely new type of television series called Peyton Place. 60 million viewers a night ensured that the show was a huge hit. She captured the heart of everyone, including the most famous pop singer in the world. By chance, she visited a friend on the set of the 49-year-old singer's current film. And a man came up and tapped me on the shoulder and asked how old I was. And uh, I said I was 19. And he said, did I want to come over and sit down with Frank Sinatra? Frank Sinatra was inviting me over to sit down. And uh, I said, sure. And I went over there. And um, as, I, as he stood up, uh, I, I said, how do you do? And I, the handle dropped somehow off my bag. That I, don't, I don't exactly know how everything spilled all over the floor, but it did. My glasses, my chewing gum, my cat food, my just everything all over the floor. And I was scrambling to pick everything up, you know. My retainer was on the floor, just right by his shoe. I picked that up first. Put everything, throwing it back in, in the bag, and I was to say, I'm so sorry, I'm so sorry. And I didn't want him to help me, because I didn't want him, like, to touch my retainer and it, and we stood up and I he was just looking at me and like no one had ever looked at me that way before I know it sounds corny but it just went right through me I just thought I, I was just spellbound Frank was certainly smitten immediately he asked me to come to Palm Springs with him and I left thinking whoa you know that he'd asked me out on a date so I, I I thought maybe he was just being nice to me until until he kissed me. He kissed me. And that was, you know, that was I was to me that was everything. This is my first real kiss. And it was certainly my first affair. You know, my first love affair. Frank taught Mia how to handle the press who were tantalized by their romance. Fortunately, they also shared many private moments. Mia's nickname for Frank was Charlie Brown. I called them the swinger and the flower child. He would give her beautiful gifts, jewelry and cars and things, and she'd write a poem for him. You know, it was great. It was just great. And she cared so much about him, and that was obvious. And that's what endeared her to me, was that she, we had him in common. So, so I was lucky, I mean, that the first person that I really loved, loved me enough to marry me. Mia's fans were shocked when she cut off her Alice in Wonderland hair, but Frank loved it. In July 1966, they married at the Sands Hotel, and then Frank triumphantly escorted his bride to greet the press. They would enjoy one year of bliss. But everything changed when Mia was selected to star in the feature film, Rosemary's Baby. I started viewing some uh, uh, television um, ser um, episodes of, uh, was it Peyton Place, I think. And I said, OK, well, let's go for Mia Farrow. Frank was very fixed in his ways. He wanted a wife who would be at home, who would be Mrs. Sinatra, and do whatever he expected Mrs. Sinatra to do. Mia was just beginning a career. And she wanted, she, she was excited about it. I had made a movie, just finished a movie. And he said, you, you've been away a long time. And I said, but if I do this movie, then it's the starring role. And it's Roman Polanski. And then I'd be set up. And then I could do just like one movie a year or whatever. I'd be offered good roles. And this movie, I think, could do it for me. He said, well, if you want to do it, then do it. So I said, well, I, I do, but not if it's going to be the end of our marriage or anything. He said, no, no. Next, Mia, the movie star, loses Frank and becomes a mother. I like to laugh. It's alive! Guys, it's movie! In Rosemary's it's Baby, alive, it's all 
An innocent young bride is chosen by witches to bear the devil's child. Don't be scared, it won't bite. Oh, it's wonderful, it's really nice. It was the role of a lifetime for 21-year-old Mia. Frank, however, was impatient for her to get the job done and spend more time with him. I guess he saw the writing on the wall because of the age difference, which ultimately, Mia said, did matter. It did really matter. It was really came down to either leave Rosemary's baby or everything would be over. And I said, you can't, you can't mean that, you know. I, I didn't believe he would really leave me. Sinatra had a project in which he wanted her to play. She, he simply ordered her to walk off the movie. And I couldn't leave the movie. And I told him I couldn't leave. Um, you can't leave a movie three months into it. Within days, Frank's lawyers appeared on the set and handed me a divorce papers. It was, it was such a shock. But I signed all the papers there and then. I just said, I don't want to read them. I just signed them. Because if somebody wants a divorce, then the marriage is over. She was utterly crushed uh, by that. But um, um, she stayed with, with, with the movie. After attempts at reconciliation, the end came. Mia left with only one possession, a beautiful music box that Frank had given her. But um, you push on, as my mother says. You push on, and that's what you do. But you don't, you don't really get over it. I mean, I, I still feel attached to Frank. And he loved her because years later, I was at a dinner with him and I mentioned that I had had a note from her and this wonderful faraway look came to his face and he said, she's the most wonderful person I've ever known. After my marriage with Frank, I literally didn't know where to go or what to do. She escaped to India. Perhaps meditation would steady her, but the experiment failed. Mia returned to New York, and it is here she met the famous composer and up-and-coming conductor, Andre Previn. You know, psychiatrists say, you know, you pick somebody. I think that's rubbish. You don't pick somebody. You know, you just gamble. Somebody likes you, and you like them, and you just hope to God it's right, you know? Because you don't really know them. They unfold over years. But Andre's ardor was absolutely something I'd never known. Of course I pursued him, you know. Those, uh, those big helpless eyes, you know, they, they will lead you into all kinds of, of pursuits. Utterly charming. Utterly. He's the smartest guy, funniest, you know, dearest. Why wouldn't I fall for him? But I certainly pursued her. And uh, to be fair, she didn't run that fast, you know. So we, we hit it off right away. Their love affair was intense. And before they married, Mia became pregnant with twin boys. She asked her old friend Dolly for advice. And he said, be very careful, is the way he put it. He said, uh, attention. He said, very careful. And no married, he said, don't marry him. And, of course, I totally disregarded him. The Previn family settled into a large home in England where Mia took care of their infant twins. Andre, however, traveled the globe in order to solidify his new career. On the second year we were married, if you put all the days together, which I did, just for my own edification, Andre and I spent 14 days together. I was uh, competing not for the right things, but, but for... Uh, uh, success and recognition and, and uh, remuneration and all, all the dumb things. And uh, it made life difficult for us later. Nevertheless, Mia was determined to expand her family. I think she had a very strong feeling when she was lying in bed with polio as a child that she wanted to take care of her children. Mia and Andre knew that their sons would love a sister. In Paris, an adoption agency had waiting for them a tiny, sickly baby girl orphaned by the war in Vietnam. They named her Lark Song. 
there was a, uh, a nun, and she was carrying a, a wicker basket, like a laundry basket. And she came, and she saw us, and she came over, and she said, Voici votre bébé, you know, handed us the wicker basket. Mia burst into tears. I looked inside the wicker basket, there was this baby, and when we looked up, the nun was gone. She was just tiny, little stick, stick limbs, beautiful child. And then we, we were, she was ours. You know, and we took, we took the next plane back to Gatwick and, and brought her home to her brothers. Lark grew to be a healthy and happy little girl, adored by her brothers. When Andre was home, he captured many such moments on film. Mia did work occasionally. In 1973, while making The Great Gatsby, she was pregnant again. Andre and Mia named their son Fletcher. We had a garden. Um, the house was beautiful. My father playing the piano echoed through the house all the time. Each adoption was carefully considered, and Mia felt it was important for Lark to have a Vietnamese sister. Impossibly, uh... Western Union arrives at at the door from this this woman in Vietnam saying that um, she had put a, a baby on the plane for us. The plane had then crashed. Um, Eighty children had died. She she had lived because she was in the intensive care, which was in the top part of the plane. That was Daisy. That was little Daisy. I know, she told me that I was tiny, I was wearing doll's clothes, and I was so weak that I couldn't scream, I couldn't make noises. But there was something in the quality of her gaze, you know, I knew Daisy would be okay. The Previn's final adoption happened when an agency sent Mia a snapshot of an abandoned Korean girl running wild in the streets. Her age was figured at about six. They named her Suni. A small child with a shaved head and sores all over her face. And I just, that was my daughter. I, I completely bonded to this little child. She wrote to me about Suni just after they had come home. And um, it's an eloquent letter. It's not very long, but it is very descriptive about this child this precious little child. She was a beautiful little thing. Coming up, Mia meets Woody Allen and confronts her greatest challenge. Hi, I'm Jane Fonda, and you're watching Lifetime, television for women. This year I will not freak out. Intimate portrait. Despite their love for each other and their six children, inevitably the marriage failed. We were apart so much, and we were both young and, and uh, uh, fairly silly about it. And so things happened that we never wanted to happen. It ended by um, another woman, you know, came into the picture. And I maybe handled it badly. I moved out with my kids. And by the time I realized I shouldn't have moved out. She had moved in. <laughs> How is the parade? By 1980, Mia began a new life with her children in New York. Fortunately, her mother had room in the same apartment Mia grew up in. Finding work was a necessity, and soon she was back on stage in romantic comedy with Anthony Perkins. Her teenage twins were away at school, and Mia was ready to adopt another child. I'll never forget when she called me up and she said, do you think I should adopt a child who has cerebral palsy or one who's blind for my next child? It wasn't, which role shall I take? Shall I take the next Bogdanovich movie or the next John Franken? You know, it's just, it's what child, what handicap am I equipped to deal with, you know, now? Where is the love going to come from next? Mia wanted Suni to have a Korean sibling. Fletcher loved his new brother, Moses, who had cerebral palsy. Over the years, Mia provided him expert therapy, and he thrived. Uh-huh. How old are you now? Five. How does it feel? Good. Anything you want to say? Yes. Okay. Dad, I love you. I love you. 
Mia didn't think any man would be interested in a single mother with many children, but then she became involved with the renowned filmmaker Woody Allen. Frank and Andre were open and passionate, but Woody had a quiet charm that was irresistible. He called me one day. I'd been sick, and he told me that he loved me. And I, and I loved him, too. And I really, I really needed him and looked forward to seeing him. And it was a great light in my life. Although Woody had been married twice, he had never been a parent. Every day, he came to visit Mia and her children. I think Woody Allen had a difficult time communicating with us children. On a, uh, on a human level almost. It was always a little strained, um, like he didn't really know how he should be behaving, sort of. One day, Mia asked Woody to take care of Fletcher and Daisy while she went to the dentist. When I came back, Woody was throwing his hats and gloves and scarves into the fire. And I said, what's going on? And the children, of course, were thrilled. And he said, well, we ran out of stuff to do. The kid just didn't have any idea. Now Mia's film career blossomed as she appeared in many of Woody's films. However, as her director, Mia felt Woody was cold and critical. It was, I think that was when I started being afraid of him as well as, as well as loving him, when I started working with him, because there was a very scary side to him. This is Moses' first fish. Can you, oh, okay. Weekends in Connecticut were special. Woody, naturally a city person, enjoyed himself there too. Mia knew in her heart he was her life's partner. She adopted a sweet American baby girl. Dylan O'Sullivan Farrow at three days old. A year later, Woody and Mia had their own child. They called him Satchel. She had love in her heart for each and every child. Sometimes I'm not even sure where she gets the, the energy for it all. Oh, it's an average summer day. It's the sort of day when no one feels like doing much of anything, and everyone is pretty successful at what they're doing. Little Moses has some energy. Even the baby is enjoying the hot summer day. Suddenly, a sound was heard out in the water. And a monster rose from the deep. Everyone was in a panic. Everyone ran. The baby was snatched. They ran for cover. But Fletcher took a stand. But the monster kept coming. The monster came into the house. Everyone in the house was soon quite horribly dead and the monster was full monster found he liked the little house by the water and he lived happily ever after you wouldn't look at those people and think oh well this is mia and her kids and then this guy i mean they were a family and i guess he never understood that because the boundaries he crossed were monstrous. In 1991, Suni was 19 and attending college nearby, coming home for weekends. Suddenly, after 12 years with Woody, Mia's life was shattered to pieces. He left in plain view pornographic photos he had taken. It took Mia a moment to realize that it was Suni. Woody was having an affair with her daughter. It was an inexplicable turn of events. The fact that the partner that you've chosen would stray to begin with is, is hard to swallow. But when it's with your own child... Mia lost Sun Yi, who left her home forever to be with Woody. Then, Woody filed suit claiming Mia was an unfit mother. Of the five children living with her, he demanded sole custody of three, Dylan, Satchel, and Moses. It was, it was as if an ax had fallen, you know. I, I was a different person 
From that moment on, I've been a different person. There are stories of mothers who were able to lift a whole car to free their, their trapped infant from under it. And I think that's the same sort of strength, almost, really, that she mustered uh, or must have, must have been able to pull together to really keep the whole family from just falling apart. It was just a, a nightmare, a long nightmare, endless. Um, it made my whole family a lot stronger, though. Um, definitely my mother. My mother is somebody I admire so much for that, for everything she went through and how she pulled out of it. The judge said, Mr. Allen has demonstrated no parenting skills that would qualify him as an adequate custodian for Moses, Dylan, or Satchel. Since the trial, he has had little contact with any of them. Well, she won. She won in the courts. With all his money, with all his power, she's a fighter, and she won. Next, Mia and her family are stronger than ever. Mia. Widow's Peak was a godsend because it came right after the trial, this whole thing of Woody trying to take my children away from me. Um, and just right at the end of the trial, I got offered Widow's Peak in Ireland. You know, the Irish love to talk and sing and have a glass of Guinness and, and be family and be together. And, and Mia, Mia loves all that. And the beauty of the place, I, I, I think it speaks to everyone, but anyone with an ounce of Irish blood, I mean, you feel the calling. I got a little cottage over there, and it's there for a time in my life when I hope I'll be able to get back. I, I, I plan to be buried in Ireland. In the film Widow's Peak, Mia played an Irish spinster with a secret. I wondered after all of the things that I'd been through, could I ever really act again? You know, was I capable of it? Did I have any of the old artifice left? You know, could I be, could I put on an accent? There are times, not all the time, sometimes, when I feel we were a bit hard on them. Well, they were a bit hard on us. She's one of those people that you can call up at 4 o'clock in the morning and say, you know what, Mia, I know you have um, 13 children, but um, <laughs> I need to come over and talk to you right now. And, and she'd say, come on right over. It's a, it was a serendipitous movie all around. I, I gained a good friend. I got a house in Ireland. And I did a good movie. After completing Widow's Peak, Mia made a major decision. She would leave her Manhattan apartment forever. Connecticut is where Mia and her children wanted to be. When we left New York, I couldn't wait. I couldn't wait. We'd been through so much in that apartment in, in recent time. And this place is heaven for us. Satchel, the son that Woody and Mia had together, got tired of his classmates calling him a book bag. He changed his name to Seamus. Seamus is 10. He's a little wizard. He, he wants to be an astrophysicist. He is an old soul. He's wise beyond reason. And he's absolutely devastatingly charming. Oh, I thought I saw him. No, no. You need your glasses on. Yeah, I really do. And funny, so, so smart. What a guy. Thaddeus, his brother, is from India. And uh, we've had him now three years. And he's paraplegic. And he uh, has a smile that would light up Connecticut. A wonderful, wonderful kid. People think that she adopted children helter-skelter. Every adoption was planned. For instance, she has a black child, Isaiah, who was a sweet dear child. He was a crack baby. Then she got Kaylee Shea, who's a beautiful little black girl, so that he would not be the only black child. The family makeup kit. The vampires have to wait. You still have that box of claws and fangs. I, I want to. I want to be an Evelyn. Okay. Jason, thanks for coming. From Frankie. Thank you, thank you so much. Oh, Tam, don't tell everyone about Ireland. You have the whole world going. She had Tam, who was blind, 
Then she got Frankie, who is blind, who can help her. So this is all thought out, all planned beautifully, and it all works. When I first went there, I must say I had this image of her home, which I think is probably an image that a lot of people have. I think that I thought it would be some sort of completely chaotic, very bohemian, hippie kind of children running all over the place kind of house. And it wasn't. It's, 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 if you were a child, it would be your ideal home. If you're an adult like me, it was like, I wish I could move in tomorrow and buy the place lock, stock and barrel. There's such thought and care and love in every detail of that house. And then I hear this pounding outside my window at 3 o'clock in the morning. I think, oh, you know, being from L.A., I'm thinking, oh, we're all going to die. And I look out. As I, I actually was, like, frozen in my bed as the sun came up. And finally, I peek around. It's Mia's big horse, Jake, is eating all the flowers. And I got her up, and we're running around in our nightgowns chasing him. And I thought, this is fun. You know, this is how it should be. Hi, Mom. Over the years, Maureen spent many happy days at this house. But in 1998, Mia lost her best friend, her champion. You look sweet. I just miss her, you know. I miss her on an animal level. I want my mommy. I miss her on an intellectual level. I've, I've lost um, my most valuable source for, you know, the best kind of objectivity and I miss she always had a, a laugh for me and I just miss her on every level Stop it. Mia's children would never forget their grandmother but the family carried on one day the kids came home from school to learn that their aged horse Chrissy had been put to sleep four children went to put flowers on her grave before dinner Let there be peace on earth. 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 Thaddeus, did you want brown rice? Yes. Say a special prayer for Chrissy. Yes. Oh, Chrissy has wings now. Chrissy's up there with Pegasus. A bright new star. And Grandma's riding Chrissy. Grandma's riding Chrissy. And Pegasus. Frank Sinatra too, Mommy. Frank Sinatra too. <gasps> Who wanted a Tam? White rice or brown? I do, um, neither, please. Mom! It's such a funny idea. What? Mommy? Grandma and Frank Sinatra riding on Chrissy <laughs> in the sky. Mommy and Grandpa and Uncle Michael. There have been many losses in my life. And um, I now, I get, I get it now. I get it. But I didn't get it then. You know, that life is about losing and about doing it as gracefully as possible and enjoying everything in between, having as many laughs as possible, giving all you have. And we have responsibility. We have responsibility to do that. And you get a tremendous amount in return. That's my one song. <laughs> Lifetime's intimate portrait where women speak for themselves. Tomorrow, talk show host Sally Jesse Raphael gives us the dish on her life. Then on Thursday, it's another chance to meet actress Mia Farrow. And Friday, it's Eileen Ford. Only on Lifetime, television for women. Through every step in her career, she went against convention. I just wanted to be who I was, and that had to be enough. Intimate Portrait, Andy McDowell. Premiering next Tuesday night at 10 on Lifetime. Mia. Telling it like it is. And easily winning the best pixie haircut ever award. I'll say. Hey, New Attitudes is coming up next. Yeah.